This is an, an age of disruption, of profound revolutionary change. What we're really asking ministers is to empower the ambassadors. The only thing that you really push forth is the truth. You don't see many women represented when it comes to the decisions as to how to handle the pandemic. Um, this event today, Made in Europe, How to Keep Up the Fight in the Electric Car Race, comes at a pretty important time. You'll all be aware of the broader political conversations happening right now in Brussels, Berlin and Paris over the 2035 zero emissions mandate. We'll discuss that. Um, we'll also get into Euro 7 and questions of broader economic competitiveness around the Inflation Reduction Act, etc., etc. Um, setting the scene. We have some great panelists to discuss these things. The housekeeping remarks obviously have to come first. I'd like to thank our partner for the event, ASEA, the European Automobile Manufacturers Association, for making this event in our home office possible today. Um, as ever, we like to make our events interactive so you can ask questions. However, we're doing it online in the digital age, which means you have to go to Slido, which is an app I think everybody uses these days for these kind of Brussels uh, events. And the hashtag for it is uh, electric car Europe. Uh, you can also tweet about it at Live Political. And we have the team of events people in the background looking at all these questions, looking at the tweets, uh, boosting engagement with the event today. This, I have to say, is exclusive for those of you in the room, at least for the next few hours, because we're not going to release the video of this event until tomorrow morning. So actually, it's quite a nice uh, forum to have some, some extra insights into the kind of conversation we're going to have today before the rest of the world gets to see it tomorrow. Um, so let's kick off. Luca De Mayo, he's the chairman of ASEA and chief executive officer of Renault. Please join me on the stage and we'll get going. Good. I even get an applause. That's <laughs> it. That's but before good. we do get going, there's one thing I do have to ask everyone to do, and that's vote in our survey, uh, which we have on the Slido app, which I've just told you to download and use. Hashtag Electric Car Europe. You can then answer the question from Isaiah. Would rising car prices, a topic we're going to discuss in just a second, would rising car prices put you off investing in a new car? There's, I think, A, B, and C uh, answers. So you can select whichever one you agree with, and we'll come back to the answer at the end. If you're um, if you're poor, no. That's, yeah. that's, that's the answer. Affordability is a serious issue in the <laughs> auto sector these days. Luca, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Le let's kick off very, very quickly because we don't have that much time, sadly. Um, we're in the midst of a major political fight about the 2035 mandate for zero emission yeah. sales of cars and vans. This is an issue that you have very, very strong views on. Uh, where's the landing zone here between Berlin and Paris and Brussels? Ah, the, 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 I think nobody knows and it's not up to you to decide where the thing will go. Um, I'm speaking here, as I say, and uh, we have been advocating on one side for technological neutrality into the debate uh, and on the other side to you know allow us to continue uh, to invest in uh, the uh, in the energy transition without being you know stopped or you know perturbated by you know a bunch of regulation that are piling up and it will cost us a lot of money that we could put on you know on electric cars on hydrogen on all the things so these are the two messages that are come from the industry, the third one being again, and I, I want to use the opportunity to to actually underline it. Nobody in the industry is actually questioning the the what. It's it's about the how mm -hmm. we do it, but nobody is questioning the fact that uh, that we have to move to a zero impact uh, industry. And the best proof is that we're putting like 250 billion <laughs> euros in the development of the thing. So nobody can tell us that we're not doing it. Yeah, I mean, is, is that useful for you though? Because we, we've talked about this before that you had the perspective it should have been 2040. That argument was, so we thought, settled. Yeah. And companies like your own and the members of ASEA have made pretty um, long ranging investment decisions centered around this switch to electro mobility or hydrogen, zero emission cars. Yeah. And now we have this great uncertainty yeah. over the 2035 date. Is this useful for you? 
I mean, I think that everybody has, once the, deba the debate was, uh, let's say, was concluded at the political level, I mean, job, the job of people like us is to actually prepare the organization to hit the target, right? Uh, we only think that uh, th the question is, what are the consequences of the timing into the thing? What are the impacts on the competitiveness of the auto e European automotive industry? What are the impacts on, uh, you know, on our on our on the employment, uh, on our cost, and finally, if is this thing bringing really in that fashion uh, that improvement of uh, you know of uh, of environment uh, impact uh, really or not? So and there we can debate. And uh, e-fuel is a potential solution. Uh, German automakers and the auto industry e largely obsessed with it. Potential solution that could be others, but I mean we stick to the idea that normally. And you have uh, you, you are probably more expert than me on that, but you know the principle of technological neutrality is a principle that is underpinning any regulation uh, normally. And uh, so Europe is the only place in the world where actually regulation is forcing with a single technological solution at uh, the way it is proposed right now. And this we think it's uh, it's pretty dangerous because you have to tell us where. Uh, we, you want, or the regulator wants, or the politician or the states want us to go, but not how. Leave it to the engineers to, you know, that have a certain, you know, understanding and competence on the thing. That's a simple thing we're saying. And but so, and the if you will debate, we didn't call for it. It's uh, it's coming. It's coming from from Germany, but it's one of potentially the opportunities that are on the table. But. Um I mean, if there were a commission person here, which sadly there isn't in the room as far as I know right now, yeah. but they would say that we're not telling you what to do. We're saying zero emissions by 2035 from the tailpipe. Yeah. It's up to you to decide how to get there. Yeah, but it's, not, uh, it, it's actually not written like this, and uh, it is not necessarily written like this. And right now, the way the thing is framed, it's only calling for BEV. There is another bug into the system, is, uh, is that we, the whole thing is built on uh, a well-to-wheel concept, so which captures only a part of the story. But even, I think it's a pretty much of a, let's say also of a revolution that s some of the manufacturing, including ourselves, and here I'm speaking as the CEO of Renault, are actually calling for a cradle-to-grave approach into the thing, because this is the truth. We don't want to tell our truth, we want to <laughs> simply tell the truth, and the truth is cradle-to-grave. So try to put cradle-to-grave in the equation, mm. and you will see that maybe uh, the things will change, and the understanding of what impact on one technology on another will be different. Well, the Commission is committed to having that conversation over the next few years in its consultancies and its various impact assessments. But in the meantime, we're looking for a political solution now. You, uh, you speak German, you speak Spanish, you speak Italian, you speak French, you speak all the languages. You've worked across the industry. You speak to your peers very, very regularly. Yeah. Well, where is there a landing zone in this dispute, given that? Most countries and most people in Brussels thought 2035 was a done deal, and now the Germans and the Italians say they want more. Where is the landing? Zone? I don't think that. Uh, I think. I think you have to. You know, you have two or three th things that are crossing together, which is actually also the problem for us because uh, piling up, uh, you know, one regulation uh, or on the other, it doesn't build a, tra a strategy, right? It doesn't build a strategy. It's a different story. So you put regulation. It's not. You know, mm. it's not a strategy. And I think that. We have to converge on, uh, you know, on the zero impact to, you know, a certain day 2050 for the overall thing. Uh, we have seen some, uh, some analysis even in the Parliament this morning showing that the tr transport is part of the of the thing, but the decarbonization and the uh, air pollution uh, thing in the city is actually a team sport. So it will have to be coordinated across industry, and that's the most important thing that the authority can do is actually bring all the you know sectors that have an impact around the table to discuss how to do it. Of course, we will take our our responsibility. If you if you if you ask me for a landing zone, I think that again we if we can engage in the 2035 with the, uh, respecting the principle of technology and neutrality, that means giving options on the thing will be fine and on the other on the other on the other hand we have a very short term issue which is the potential approval of the euro 7 regulation we, w which in the current fashion and form it is written we think will be a hurdle because it will cost a lot of money and will bring no impact uh, for the problem is designed for which is uh, 
air, uh, you know, air quality is in, uh, into the city. That's what we think. And based on facts, and we are more than ready to engage with anybody, you know, uh, anybody, uh, to prove, uh, you know, facts and numbers from the people that do the thing and are investing it. That's why I'm here today in Brussels, is actually to show that we're not closing the things, we are opening and we want to show the figures so that we can debate, uh, like in any trial, the truth comes because you have, you know, different parts telling the perspective on the thing, and then yeah. you have the judge saying, yeah, okay, that's the truth. So, so then on Euro 7 specifically, Skoda now say they will have to close a plant if it's passed in its current form. Of course, Euro 7 is the suite of legislation yeah. that governs, regulates non-CO2 pollutants, which yeah. is quite wide-ranging. Yeah. Um, Audi says 2025 for it to come into force on cars is way too soon. What's your perspective at the top of the industry on what should be changed? On the Euro 7? Yeah. I mean, we, we tend to resist to the idea that, uh, that there should be a Euro 7 on, uh, on, uh, you know, on, on tailpipe because we think that the, the proportionality of the thing is, is not there simply. So there's too much, too much money involved in the cost of the product and in investment in hours of engineering that we could actually on one dedicate to the transition to electric cars or to other technology, hydrogen, whatever you want to, uh, you, you name them. And the impact on the product cost is much <coughs> higher than what is, uh, you know, currently publicly shared by some supposed experts that don't know what the real cost is. But I know <laughs> because you know, I, you know, I run a company, and it's a listed company, and I know exactly, you know, what it makes to me and it costs me to to move a car from mm. Euro six to default to Euro seven. So I, I'm here to say it. And we know that it's a big impact. A cigarette, you know, publicly mentioned like 2,000 euro price per each one of the cars. In some cars, this is 10% of the price of the thing. So you make a simple elasticity calculation that you learn the first class in, in microeconomy and, you know, 1.52, it means that the, the you know, European market but might go down. But, but let, let, let's assume that the commission is not ready just to throw this in the bin yeah. and there is going to be some kind of legislation. What yeah. would you like to be changed? Is it just start date or is it watering down all of I the I think targets? we should concentrate on, on and once we have the clear and agreed measurement on the let's say uh, measurement which is actually not there we should probably focus on the on the tire and brake pollution because they represent 90 percent of, of thing today and this money that we put on brakes or on on tires of course this has to be done with mm. people that do braking and the people do tires but this work that we do will not be thrown out of the window in electric cars actually electric cars they might consume more tires they might break more if they're heavier except this is one thing and then for sure the key issue into the proposal of the Euro 7 is that this thing is like assuming that we can cover with technical work, with engineering work, 100% of the use cases, which is a utopia. Because a car, a combustion car, cannot behave the same when you are with an elephant on the roof and uh, you know on on the slope as much as you 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 can How do many it. times have yeah. you driven with an elephant on the roof? Never. The and that's exactly the point. And this is exactly the point. So today's regulation are covering 95% of the use cases, and those last five that they are demanding into, into this thing are just technically impossible. I don't know how, I mean, I mean at least m my engineers, and there are people that, you know, they kind of do combustion engines since 124 years. I mean, they didn't survive each 124 years, but we know how to do it. Uh, I can tell, they are telling us that it's impossible to comprehend all the, all the possible use cases. So this is clearly, the core of the issue. The other thing is, and this is you have to understand, is that the co Eurosev is not a new technology. There's nothing of a new technology, okay? It's very limited. So the cost on the product itself, the parts, is actually pretty limited. So you have people here, you know, from the engine industry, powertrain, et cetera, et cetera. What will cost is the development, the testing, the homologation of the all variety of, uh, of, uh, of engines and all the combination with each one of the models, etc. This is thousands of hours of, in my case, probably 2,000 engineers that will do that for two years, three years. Those guys, they cost money, and that, that cost will then be amortized <laughs> on the cost of the product. That's the way account, you know, accountants, uh, you know, will, 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 and this will make the number that, uh, uh, Secret shared, which is not a Renault number, is a number that comes from you know, from the consultation with the mm -hmm. all the industry in within the ASEAN. 
Let's just look at the global picture um, generally. Yeah. We've been talking in Brussels about the critical raw materials yeah. at the last days, the Net Zero Industry Act to yeah. This is Europe's response to the Inflation Reduction yeah. Act. Is this a zero-sum game in your perspective? You're a guy that has to allocate finite resources across your business. Yeah. Uh, you work with your peers that do this on a global scale too. Yeah. Um, is, is this a zero-sum game or is this a relay race, as some have argued, whereby subsidies in other major global car markets will will increase the velocity of investment in these technologies anyway and it's good for business in five ten years from now i mean there is all you know everything about what you said but i think that for sure you know we're living right now a pretty asymmetrical competition landscape with the you know chinese if if we assume that the future is about ev battery cars or uh, especially, do uh, we assume that? Are we let, let, let's assume it because that's what we assume. That's where we're putting the money. I mean, there's no again, uh, there's nobody. Um, I I don't think there's anybody on my colleagues that is developing a completely new engine in Europe. <laughs> All the money is going into, you know, batteries, and I mean they might evolve what they have, mm. but nobody's you know from scratch developing a new combustion engine in Europe. All the money is, is going to electric or hydrogen technology. So let's assume that EV will be the dominant technology and it will take more and more, which is fine. And our strategy, our budget are designed uh, for that. Okay. The reality is that Europe uh, is basically ha probably lagging maybe 10 years behind China, for example. Okay, more or less. The Chinese started very early because they understood that they couldn't beat us on the combustion engine, so they had to go and, and so and they worked very consistently from the sourcing of the material with some geopolitical uh, implication. So that means it was not only the work of the industry, but it was the work of the whole country trying to make friends in places where the materials are. Okay, this is the idea. Yeah, to investing in cam pre cam, so that means part of the the chain to install uh, you know and create capacity for gigafactories mm -hmm. and blah blah plus doing making sure that the, the the market will pick up and it will take time i mean today in china you sell 6 7 million uh, evs we sell a million in europe so it it tells you that the proportion you know th th in this thing we don't control the value chain mm -hmm. as we did before so we have to organize ourselves we have to catch 10 years of delay. Okay, that's why timing is important. And if we are very, very good and we want to catch 10 years, you are, uh, and you have to assume that they will st stand still, then <coughs> in 10 years, and 10 years bring us to 2035. Basically, yeah. Okay, so you understand that it's, it's, uh, it's an assumption that the, they will stay where they are. Mm. And we have to, you know, we have to kind of catch up 10 years. This is the situation we're in. That's why we're talking about flexibility. You know, in any strategy that you do, okay, not regulation, any strategy that you do, you kind of adjust. You see how it works. You go, so I, I think I know there are discussion of revision, uh, you know, of, of the thing. This is also important because we need to give a, a flexibility. I remember the Chinese changing local subsidies, national subsidies, density of the battery that they wanted to have from the thing regularly, every year. And until they got where they were. This is the Chinese side. And then you witness the on the American side, okay, you see an IRA that is trying to create a full uh, local ecosystem, okay. And uh, I think that the money that is foreseen within the European budget is actually pretty substantial. I don't think it's an issue of how much money, <laughs> but these guys in six, in six months, they poured more than $50 billion into the system. Mm. And so there is a question of how, how fast and how easy we can access to the financing in order to be able to do the project. So it's more of a, the way you structure, the, it's not the amount of money, but how you direct that and how fast and how easy it is to finance some of the projects. I had three final questions for you, but as you've just answered one of them, so there's just yeah, two. two. Uh, it's first of all, easy. on e-fuels, because everyone's talking about e-fuels yes. right now, from somebody that's worked across the market, yeah. are e-fuels a mass market solution for passenger cars, or are they niche anyway? At, at, at this stage, uh, they are a kind of a niche solution, because we have to build the whole uh, you know, supply chain of, uh, of e-fuels. But I think they are, the, they are an opportunity. You can, a, as always, you start from you know, a niche, and then you actually explode the thing. Mm. 
And when you go into volume, then the cost will go down, etc. I think that the big opportunity for Europe, or at least for some of the countries, is in case we are able to consider nuclear energy, a kind of a clean energy, and produce e-fuels, uh, then uh, it will be an advantage for Europe because we have some you know, uh, nuclear energy uh, available. And uh, I think that the e-fuels will come from the aviation, so that will be the first thing. But why not, not letting you know, the automotive industry participate to that kind of uh, value stream, mm. you, you, you understand? So I think it will come for the, from the aviation because you cannot put like uh, uh, 20,000 kilowatt of, uh, of batteries on a plane because it will not uh, take off. But, but uh, so they have to find that kind of solution. So we yeah. should participate and it's, it's one of the uh, uh, solution at the table. And if you do it with nuclear energy or with the renewable energy, then uh, from a cradle to grave thing, it could be uh, an option. That's what we're saying. But you say cradle to grave in your capacity as Renault CEO, not on behalf of the whole industry. Exactly, exactly. But I'm trying to convince uh, everybody <laughs> because I, I, I care a lot about being transparent, and transparent, being honest and telling the truth, not, not our truth. Because I think I, I start from the assumption that if, as an SA, as an industry, we tell the truth, then we will become more credible. Okay. And that's what we need. One final question, because then we've got to crack on, Luca. The, the industry, as you've, as you've talked about, is going through profound transformation. Yeah. It's led by, by regulation. This yeah. is causing a very disruptive effect on, on what companies are doing and planning for in the future. This has had consequences. Last year, two members left ASEA, the organization you're now chairman of. Yeah. I wonder, d is, are we going through a, a period now where the industry is splintering? You have what's happening in other sectors, like the airline industry, for example, where no frills and legacy characters go their own way. Mm. Are you able to hold this ship together as chair of this organization? But look, I hope so. I think that the reason why some of, um, some of the members left uh, the thing is probably a, a sign that they didn't felt, I mean, they felt frustration and they probably didn't felt uh, you know well represented uh, you know by the by the association that's why the, you have an, a new team on board and and, and Sigrid is new to to the ASEA uh, with a completely different uh, spirit uh, i think that uh, you know i respect the intelligence and the let's say and the competence of the people that decided and, and the opinion of the, of the people but i still believe that we need to to this is a team sport is a team sport within the industry with all the suppliers, etc. But it goes beyond the automotive industry. So we can only manage the, the, you know, the energy transition if we are able to talk with energy industry, with infrastructure industry, with the ONGs, with the, so the NGOs, etc., etc. So I think is, uh, you know, one of the role I I believe if I could ask to you know some of the important authorities is to actually force us to sit around the table and to actually discuss horizontally the thing because otherwise we're not going to make it. So the way we're handling the issue with my colleagues and, and under the, you know, under the control of, of Sigrid is actually to look for, uh, you know, a kind of a horizontal uh, to open uh, approach to it. So because we're not, not going to be able to solve the things uh, only ourselves. Okay. So we need the help of the others. And, uh, and I think it's kind of working. This is also the reason why I'm here. Yeah, yeah, and thank you for coming. If I can ask you now to get off the stage, of, I will. Although I would love to talk more uh, about your quickly. trips with an elephant <laughs> uh, up the mountains, but perhaps later. Thank you, Luca. Right, so we're going to switch straight into another chat with three panelists this time. Uh, Julia, Alexander, Benjamin, if you could join us uh, here on the stage. And then uh, Luca, should there be points he's particularly offended by, uh, allegations about the auto industry, he can maybe chime in towards the end of the chat again and just give his thoughts on what we're going to talk about. So, um, Julia Poliskanova from Transport and Environment is here, is, a, is a, a very fluent speaker on all things electric vehicles and clean mobility. Benjamin Krieger, who represents the, uh, the uh, suppliers, the thousands of European companies that work in the supply industry for the automotive uh, sector. Thank you for coming, Benjamin. Uh, Alexander Vondra, who's going to be having a lot more events like he had this morning, talking about the nuances of automotive legislation. He's the rapporteur, former Czech minister, and the rapporteur now in the European Parliament on the Euro 7 legislation we've just been talking about. Thank you all for coming. Um, Alexander, if I can ask you, first of all, just to give a brief state of play on where you are in terms of drafting the Parliament's version of the Euro 7 text and to say what your early perspective is. Is it too much too soon, as the industry thinks? Well, uh, hello. So I have to speak in this because my head is larger than the <laughs> others, so they were not able to. Uh, 
uh, to put uh, the mic uh, on, 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 on this. So where we are just in the beginning. Uh, I was waiting with this uh, hearing. Originally, you know, my idea was to organize the hearing uh, within the ENVI committee, but, you know, they said it's too overloaded with a lot of work, so um, I decided to do this uh, as a public event in the European Parliament on my own, so thanks everybody who took part. And I was waiting. Uh, I had basically two timelines in my, uh, in my jacket. In the left is uh, the slower, in the right is the faster. And <laughs> Uh, the slower it is well known, uh, the faster could be used uh, the, in a case that I would have a feeling that we can make uh, uh, a real uh, progress and uh, desirable result. So most likely I will submit that, but still waiting for some consultation with um, uh, now also with the parliamentary stakeholders. So. Uh, yes, I am under some pressure, both, you know, from the both camps, you know, business, they want certainty, logically, uh, in advance, uh, but then the, 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 the proposal would require a lot of changes that we're talking about in the morning. And I, oh, from the green, uh, green part of the parliament, I also uh, under the pressure because they want everything fast immediately. And, <laughs> but, but you, and I prefer the quality over the quantity. Uh, but, but you can say now, we'll come back to this, but there will be a lot of changes in your draft. Of course, you know, as always, <laughs> uh, even maybe even my own group will, will propose <laughs> some changes. So, Julia, um, the industry is very clear about this. Euro 7 isn't going to fly in its current form. Alexandra is getting prepared to use a lot of ink, making changes. What's your perspective? Right, so starting with Euro 7, great, really topical debate. Thanks a lot. We also have TNE at this, allowing us to, to give our insights. Um, maybe a, a few insights on Euro 7 to share. First of all, on the broader picture. We're not the only country in the world that is at the same time going for zero emission vehicles and actually regulating air pollutants from engines. America, China, all doing the same thing. And, and we don't have time to have a full debate about the design of this. But when we look at NOx limits, for example, they're actually higher in a America and China. And they're going even faster than us today on zero emission vehicles. So that's normal to regulate both. And they target completely different areas. The second insight is as long as we have engines across Europe, and actually today questioning of the 2035 zero emission goal, and, and potentially having even more engines, we don't know how many, because if you put e-fuel in your car, the same amount of pollutants come out as a fossil petrol. This actually makes Euro 7 and a potentially much stricter Euro 7, even more important. Because we will actually, in, on our numbers alone, before we talk about e-fuels, we will have 100 million various diesel, petrol, and hybrid cars until 2035. That's a huge volume to actually amortize investments. And, and the last insight around feasibility of this. So um, look, today when we look at the data, we see that actually over half of the current Euro 6 vehicles already meet around 40 milligrams or 30 milligrams of NOx. That shows it's feasible technology is there off the shelf, put this on exhausts, right? The problem is that the other 40% of vehicles are responsible for the big amount of pollutions. And, and it's, it's considerable because 70,000 of people across Europe on average die from prematurely air pollution from road transport. So it's not a small problem, it's a big problem, technology is there. We all talk about costs, and I did want to react directly, uh, Mr. Dimmer, to, to what you said. So we looked at what the Commission experts have actually uh, done. It's not our own numbers as, as TNE. and We see that on average it takes 300 euros per car, up to 500. So that's a cost of a Renault Clio paint job, basically, so very, very affordable. And I just double-checked, and actually the cost from the Commission is already incorporate research and development costs, certification type approval. So it's an average number, which is very low. So we have 70,000 of people dying prematurely. Technology is all there, costs you 300, and potentially will have engines endlessly in Europe. What is the answer? The answer is yes to Euro 7. Let's do it. Let's all work together, see what's possible, how, where we can improve. But we cannot not allow frontline communities, people who are breathing in NOx 
every day not to have cleaner air. Right, let, let's switch to Benjamin because he represents many of the companies that make these components for engines. Uh, Luca talks about the extra costs of, of uh, reiterating the combustion engine. Uh, Julia uses phrases like off the shelf and the technology is ready. What's the situation here? Hmm. Uh, thank you, <coughs> Josh, for the word and thank you for the invitation, of course. Uh, I'm sitting in the middle, fittingly, uh, because my reply is going to sit in the middle. Uh, Josh, you said too much too soon. Uh, I would say too soon, maybe, yeah, there we need to talk. Uh, too much, no. Uh, so overall, we think the proposal for Euro 7 uh, is a balanced one. There are a few aspects in there that need fixing in order for these rules to be implementable so that we can implement them in an economic way uh, and also in a technical way. Uh, and there we need to look at the relationship between limit values and boundary conditions that has been mentioned already. Bias driving should not be possible in tests uh, because otherwise we would develop vehicles against standards that don't play any role whatsoever in daily driving. Uh, we need to talk about Th that's too soon. Sorry to interrupt, but this was kind of the elephant on, on board the, the car going up the mountains kind of argument of their driving conditions. I think so, right? yes. That's, that's yeah. how I understood it, yes, correctly. Uh, and also, we talk about the implementation timeline. Here, the Commission, I think, is a little bit too optimistic. Uh, we would like to see the adoption of the regulation, the secondary legislation, and then plus two years, plus three years for light-duty vehicles and then for heavy-duty vehicles. That's very clear. Also, your members have a lot to gain, arguably, because they can get new research contracts from car makers for producing new engine technology. Is that a fair interpretation of your answer? Well, we are the solution providers. Uh, we, we will do what we are there and what we are good at. Uh, we will develop technology in order to meet the standards. But again, these need to be implementable, need to be realistic. Uh, it needs to be possible to implement these technically <coughs> and economically. Can I really Please. quickly come in on this mountain example? So it comes a lot of the time, so we're, we're really going up the hill in the coldest temperature with everyone in the car. Actually, if you look at what the Commission has proposed, this is not allowed. Only one of these extraordinary conditions can be there at one point in time to meet the limits. And even in those conditions, sorry to be a bit going into detail, but even when you have an elephant in your car, you have to be in warm temperature and driving according to the rules. Eh? Even then, they may Emissions from that are actually divided by 1.6, so you already have a benefit. There's so many flexibilities built in in the regulation with experts dr uh, drafting this, have tested all of it to say this is feasible. So we need to stop talking about these really crazy circumstances because they're not allowed in the regulation. Okay, Alexander. Well, look, I think it's a nice uh, campaign talking here with a positive uh, pic uh, uh, portrait in a positive uh, world, you know. You are a young woman. I am an old guy, you know. I remember something. I was growing up in the communism, you know. It was filled with various bands, orders, five years plans, always portraying everything would be nice and okay. And the result was that our economies were terribly lacking behind the capitalist uh, uh, free market economies in the West. So. And and we are still paying the price for this, you know, 30 years, more than 30 years ago. So, uh, you know, <laughs> I <laughs> I would recommend to be really fair here. So because, for example, what you have uh, said here, uh, that's not true. Because, you know, for example, you know, why to, to measure this if somebody is speeding on the highway with... 200 kilometers per hour. It's a job for policemen to, to, to stop him. But why should I, as I am a driver, you know, respecting uh, the rules of the game, should pay the price for those uh, uh, outlaws, you know? And uh, you can bring many, many other examples. Uh, while I, I think uh, we would have a really tough debate in the European Parliament, because this is the legislation which, uh, you know, is interesting for everybody because everybody is driving car. It's car is a, you know, issue of freedom for many people living in, in the countryside is a daily need to get to commute and to get to their work in the morning and to, uh, uh, to get back uh, in the evening. And yes, of course, it, for example, in the cities, that's a challenge to clean the environment. But, you know, you can do it with multiple uh, measures uh, uh, like uh, to introduce this, uh, the, the, the public city transportation. Why the old 
men or women living in the countryside should pay the price for inability or unwillingness of state or city to invest in the city transportation or to invest into the electromobility there, there, there certainly has made the sense. Le, let's just talk about jobs quickly because I, I think we, we, we're going to talk about Euro 7 so much over the next year uh, and we'll have plenty of time to get into the, the details of, of your proposal wh when you finish drafting it, Alexander. Uh, Benjamin, on jobs, do you anticipate that there's going to be a big impact on jobs from this legislation? I'd heard earlier today uh, that there will be a negligible impact. That was the colleague who is best placed to con comment on this from Industrial. Uh, I would say so. He probably is right. There is engineering work involved. Uh, this will keep engineers in business, uh, certainly. But talking about uh, employment, I think we need to take the, the broader picture uh, in mind. We would like to keep uh, manufacturing and development in Europe. How do we do that? Do we do that with Euro 7? No, I think we need to take a step back, look at the broader picture. How do we ensure competitiveness? And there, I think we need to, uh, to have a better alignment of different policies, better coherent policies, uh, in order to get where we, where we would like to go. Alexander, you're a former Czech minister. Um, clearly, you talked earlier about the Czech uh, Republic's economic development, and the auto industry has been a huge part of that. Over the weekend, one of the Skoda board members talked specifically about up to 10,000 jobs would be at risk, and one plant would have to close if the Euro 7 legislation in its current form came into law. We hear that all the time from the auto industry about the prospective job losses, but this was eerily specific about one plant and models that would go out of production. Um, are you already under intense lobbying over this issue of jobs and employment in the auto industry? Well, um, I would not call this lobbying, you know, because, you know, <laughs> just you have to be aware of one thing, that Czech Republic, also Slovakia, we are the largest producers of car per capita in the world. By far the, 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 the biggest. So, you know, if you have a situation that it generates uh, about 10% of your GDP, uh, if it employ about 15% uh, of the labor force, and you have a certainty that, you know, uh, with the switch from combustion to, to electromobility, uh, the, the impact would be clearly negative on the employment. That's, uh, you know, simple. Um, and then if the companies are arguing that, you know, if Euro 7 is accepted in the form as it was proposed, would immediately shut down the factory because they will be forced to shut down the production of the combustion engine cars of the lower categories, typically Škoda Fabia or Škoda Karok, uh, because they are not able to, 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 to merge the, marsh in, uh, the, the, to the price of the onboard monitoring into, in, into the price of, of, of those cheaper cars. So and I, I should say, sorry to it's a huge economic and social problem. But, but it's, it, it's actually not just about pollutants. There's also onboard monitoring systems that are mandated no, no, through look, legislation. If I would it's, vote it's uh, in, in, in my country, you would get the result 80% of the people against Euro 7, maybe 20% for, you know. Yeah. Hey, um, Julia, to use very crude language about this, is this it, a jobs and production plans collateral damage in the EU's efforts to tackle climate change? Is this what we're going to have to accept? So first of all, maybe a word on, on Skoda or a word of caution. I, I mean, it's very hard to know the reasons, but we all know that Volkswagen Group is taking a hit due to exit from Russia. So why exactly and what the economics of it are is very hard to judge. But of course, it's very easy then for a company to say, well, it's about the environmental regulation we don't like. So I think we have to take that announcement with, with a pinch of salt. But, but I would like to talk a bit more about competitiveness. So the big picture is, Let's look around the world. There is a global race for the clean tech, global race for batteries. From the US IRAs, uh, 369 billion, around 150 billion are to secure battery supply chains and critical raw materials not e-fuels. China has long dominated that, and now they're actually at here on the doorsteps in Europe, capturing what used to be European market as we go to electric. When we analyze what's happening in the market, first of all, we saw, at least until the US IRA, that Europe was about to be self-sufficient in battery cells by 2027. We have lots of projects. US IRA now is a risk to, to, to that. We also see that actually, to, to maybe a bit about Eastern Europe, I also come from Eastern Europe and it's in my heart, the, the, the 
transformation is first and foremost happening where you already have that infrastructure. So our numbers show that by 2030, if plans come online as they should, actually it will be Slovakia and Czech Republic, which will be number one per capita producers of electric vehicles in Europe, replacing the current IC manufacturing. So the transition is underway. The question to Europe is, will we dither, will we waste time discussing what is at best a niche solution if yours, or will we unite, step up, and indeed work together to implement what is the best and most optimal solution to decarbonize cars, electric vehicles, and there we do need industrial policy. What we miss today is industrial policy, proper industrial policy, including finance, but also um, policies around raw materials, to take parts of this value chain and have strategic autonomy in Europe. We're on the way there, but as long as we waste time talking about e-fuels, uh, we're we missing the train. I disagree there. Uh, I think the policies in China and the US that are relevant in this question are much more open than, than you make it appear. Yes, the batteries are very important, <coughs> and yes, we have strong competition, and we need European policies to match that in the short term. Uh, there is the word of the subsidy race that is going to come into play at some point. That's going to be a tricky one. Uh, but we also can't kid ourselves. We need much longer term policies in order to ensure that we are competitive uh, in the EU. We have a fantastic competitive advantage in one technology that we are going to give away. We are risking that we are giving away this technology plus the batteries to other regions too. And then what do we end up with? I, I, I honestly, I don't agree. I think it's not the first time in the world we're changing technology. If we follow your logic, we should have stayed with horses because back then some industry also lost jobs. Yeah, Transition the happens. The horse <laughs> hasn't been banned. Neither has the, 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 the single lens reflex camera, which is now digital. Consumers choose. But if they so choose, fine. But you don't, need to, you don't need to ban anything. But the climb, if, if you just tell me one story in history where, based on the market, we got to an environmental you know, need or climate deadline that we had to ch achieve. But look, we are not talking here about the climate. We are talking about Euro 7, which has nothing to do with the climate. Climate is a CO2 issue that was already fixed with some other legislation. This is about the emission, which are not about the climate. It's about weather in the, c in the cities. It's about, uh, about uh, the particles. Uh, it's about the microplastic in case of the, of the tires where I am in favor, you know. This measure, you know, to introduce Euro 7 for, every, uh, for each car to make a, uh, less impact on the environment in the case of the tires and brake, I'm, I'm, I'm 100% in, in, in favor of that if we provide the industry with some reasonable timeline. But here, you know, it has nothing to do with the climate. And I fully agree that, look, uh, this American capitalism is not based on the bands, orders, five years plan. It's based on freedom of choice. And, you know, Luca de Mello rightly said uh, many times the key word is the technological neutrality. So let's build an environment and then let's them to, uh, to go for the innovation, you know, and not, you know, if, if the bureaucrats are going, you know, to order the economy, then I'm really afraid of, uh, uh, for the future. Doing just to, to switch tack very briefly to what we talked about with Luca, which was the Critical Mom Raw Materials Act, also the Net Zero Industry Act, and the specific measures that the EU has published, which aim to compete with the IRA and, and similar um, subsidies in China. Is it enough, Alexander, or do we need much, much more? Well, I think that you know this uh, raw material criti critical raw material act is a b is a good start. You know, it was check my country was among those who were pushing this since the beginning. This zero net, uh, yes, it's, uh, it's a good step forward. But again, you know, we are missing the nuclear, for example, in the full scale, because uh, we are, again, the prisoners of ideologies and various bands in some countries, instead of providing, you know, uh, the full uh, space for the free innovation so here. But it's a step in the right direction, but maybe it's not enough, because the reality is that China, for example, is simply taking everything already. And are we going to fight with China for the resources? Is Europe uh, ready to do this? You know, we are now facing the war in, in, in the Ukraine. And uh, look, that's a different story, you know, the, the struggle for resources than, you mm. know, dreaming about building a paradise on the earth. You know. Benjamin, what do your members at Klepper say about this whole issue of competitiveness? Do they need more from the European Commission? 
Ooh, I, I think I answered already. Uh, the Net Zero Industry Act and the Critical Raw Materials Act are important first steps, yes, uh, in the short term, but longer term we need to do much more. Uh, I think we have a lot of uh, in tendency, a bit bureaucratic regulation, where other regions have less of that. We need to work on this. Uh, we have a massive problem with skills. We need access to skills. We need also to ensure that those people who are well trained actually stay where they are and don't move to other regions, something that I haven't heard much in, in the discussion about. Uh, we talked about industrial policy there. I, I agree very much with you. Uh, just I would like to see technology, call it what you want, technology openness, technology liberty maybe, uh, just as the other regions do, like China does, like the US does. They don't ban anything. They just make sure that things are moving in this direction. At the end of the day, we are going to need a, a variety of technologies in mobility. Electrification is going to be very important going forward. We need the enablers in place, we need the raw materials in place, we need the renewable energy in place. But we also need options where electrification is, not yet maybe, but not the, the perfect solution. Julia, is the Critical Raw Materials Act enough? So I, I, I'd like to make a few points on Critical Raw Materials please Act, but please let me first say very, very briefly on, on technology neutrality. I think what we find quite ironic as TNEs is, is the label of technology neutrality is often used to actually defend one specific technology, funnily enough, and that's if you're, if you're driven uh, petrol or diesel cars or combustion engines. And, and, and that is really ultimately if suddenly we are in a situation, nuclear e-fuels are, are really cheap, you have hundreds of millions of existing fleet on the road to decarbonize. And they don't have a place in, that's nothing to do with new car CO2 standards that we're discussing here. And ultimately, it's not a ban, it's a zero emission standard. Anyone inventing a technology with zero emissions is game. But I would like to maybe indeed talk about critical raw materials. I think that's a really topical debate. And what is really happening at the moment is the genuine decoupling of China and America, and therefore it has huge implications on supply chains. If there is one really positive example or, or you know, dr drawing from the US IRA is that a strong policy can reshape supply chains. The dependency on China is not a given. Look what's been happening in the last few months. So what I believe is absolutely paramount for Europe is to join forces with friendly countries to create a really strong bias club, like the Critical Raw Materials Club they're now talking about, attract countries like Australia, Chile, you know, Argentina, all these countries with lots of metals, and work together based on high standards, such as battery regulation, to create that de decoupling from China. I believe it is possible, I think, if we just believe things can't change, that th th there is nowhere to go. So that's important. But on top of that, and that's where Critical Raw Materials Act is so key, we also need to create strategic autonomy here in Europe. So capacities to supply raw materials we have here. Our analysis shows that we have loads of lithium. Half of lithium we need by 2030 can be mined in Europe. That's an amazing opportunity, right? So mining important, processing is even more important. Actually, that's really where the value is. China doesn't <coughs> mine everything in China, right? They have all these partnerships and they bring it to China to process. Europe can do the same, and, and that's where Critical Raw Materials Act, again, is important. And of course, recycling in the next 10 years and after. One thing that ANZIA and CRM miss is a strong finance agenda. Right, so we have relaxation of state aid. This is great. If you're lucky enough and you're in Germany or France, you, you will get more support. But what about other projects? In Sweden, lots of raw materials. Where is the support? So there, what I see is two things. First of all, I very much agree with Mr. Demer was saying earlier. We already have a lot of money. It's just hard to access. It's cumbersome, you know. So simplifying what we have is important and filling the gaps. And this is where European climate investment agenda is missing. It can be a sovereignty fund. It can be something else, but it needs to be clear, fresh money for this European value chain to build strategic autonomy, and that's the way to go. In the EU, that's easier said than done. Absolutely, but I think uh, if we don't move now and we don't step up in the game, right, especially with what USIRA is doing, uh, you know, if now, then not, if not now, then, then when? Actually, a lot, we have a lot to lose. Uh, I said before that Europe can be self-sufficient in battery manufacturing by 2027, but actually, we also see that around 70% of those projects can easily reallocate and build in the US first. So, need to act. Is, uh, is Lucas Mike still on? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, 
I want to ask you a few things just to respond to what the guys have said, and then we'll yeah. finish on 2035 with all, all three of you. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you about skills, because that point came up. I want to ask you about the cost calculation, because we also have a question from John Goodwin, who said, you know, shouldn't I say I need to, to revisit their cost assumptions about the, the extras new technology will, will, um, will demand? I also want to ask you about... Um, just generally about the price of technological innovation and, and how long your product cycles are. Um, and all, I want to do all that in about two minutes, if it's okay, okay. with you. Okay. Uh, but just the final question is, do you, um, how do you see the world? Do you see us being in a race for resources now? Is that how you view things? Of, sh of course. Of course it is. Of course we know that raw materials are pretty rare. This is the reality of the thing. And of course the whole uh, supply chain of raw materials especially in refining, is in the hands of, of China. We know it. We know it for cobalt, we know it for nickel, we know it for lithium. Of course, all these things about we will open mines, et cetera, et cetera, and we'll do the thing, will take a huge amount of time, much more than 2027. 20, in Europe, there are, take CAM and PreCAM to, to build the batteries, okay? You actually have probably two plus two players that could do the job in Europe, okay? To do CAM and PreCAM. Okay, uh, so before they get started, it will take, you ask to the, to you talk to the people, and they will tell you, I need four years to build a, a you know, a pre-cam, a cam pre-cam facility to refine the material, do the black mass, etc. And I probably need four or five years to, to you know, to go through the uh, experience curve and be competitive. Mm. Okay, this is the reality. Without taking into account that all, all these projects take a lot of energy, that energy is three, four, six times more expensive in Europe. So to become competitive, you, you got to have a productivity which is like six times what they have in China. This is the reality today. It's not a question of uh, not doing it. It's a question of timing and realizing what is the starting point. I think there is nobody that uh, you know doubts about it, at least in the automotive industry. And I repeat the thing, we can only do the stuff, okay, if uh, all the sectors that are around us play the same game yeah, we are saying this because alone we will not be able to do it. The, of course, the, the materials are, are, are very rare. This is the reality. And we can, you know, we can make friends with uh, Chile. Suddenly we discovered Chile, Australia, uh, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Etc. Suddenly we discovered those, those, those kind. How are you going to make friends with those guys? How does it work? You send them a, a nice message uh, at Christmas? Or there, is, there are some geopolitical implications? I mean, don't dream about how the all uh, regions of the world, they actually engage with these people. I mean, Mr. Von der has a lot of uh, experience also in foreign policy, will tell you what does it mean to become a friend and to have a, you know, a preferred relationship with one country mm -hmm. or another. Now, let's not be naive. Let's not be naive, please. On, on skills, yeah. are you able to, I'll give Julia a right of reply to that as well, but are you able to source the people you need with the skills that you need them to have to, to fuel the electric mobility I think, push. I think it depends on the it depends on the on, on what on, on the on the different uh, let's say jobs that you have to do right uh, because we always talk about powertrains but in fact the switch to ne next generation of cars it's a combination of the powertrain for example with electric cars but it's all uh, the software and uh, centralized electronic architecture that will come with the new cars, which will make them upgradable, more intelligent, connect. This is what we dream uh, about in the automotive industry, is, is to make the next gen, to take advantage of this discontinuity in technology, to make products that are much better than the previous generation. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm doing, in it, uh, and here I speak as, as a Renault, I'm actually training 15,000 people from now to 2025. I've already al done half of it. We founded a university, okay, to actually train the people on the f three or four key value chains, EV, software, circular economy, etc. So we are doing the job ourselves. We are paying for it, okay? And I think that many, some of the people we, we'd like to train. For example, I'd like to train uh, powertrain uh, combustion engine uh, engineers that have done this for 30 years and turn them to electric engine. So if I have, you know, Euro 7 in the middle, these guys, they will be busy for a couple of years on doing the Euro 7 testing. This is exactly what we're facing. I think there is a lot of money into, you know, European and national budget to do this. It's, it's actually pretty difficult to access. And then you have other jobs which are actually not existing in Europe. Think about the whole semiconductor industry. 
how many players are there. Mm. I mean, they're all either in Asia or, or in, in the US, et cetera, et cetera. And to attract people from the other side of the world, it's extremely complicated. So uh, there are, you know, if people that are building the, the plants, the b gigafactories, mm. uh, look who they are. They, are, they all come from Asia because these are the guys that did the plants in China, in, in, in Korea, et cetera. This is the reality of the thing. But, but, it, but it's also, sorry to interrupt, just one final question for yeah. you. It's also because the, the industry didn't really prepare amply for the transition to electric cars, right? This was a very late transition on your you, part. You can, you can blame us for whatever, but this is a fact. That's what the, the, um, and the, I mean. We want to uh, take the responsibility as an, and the new generation of CEOs and, uh, running the automotive industry for the supposed failures of our fathers. I I think it's unfair, right? So we are there. We have to do, we have now uh, s some kind of the deadline, 2035, okay, in whatever form it comes. We have to work for it, and I, I face the problem. It, it doesn't matter for me to ask myself whether 10 years ago, five years ago, I think it was potentially a collective thing. We changed direction, probably for the good, you know, to decarbonize, et cetera, et cetera. And now I have a, a guy like me has to find a solution to the problem. I think actually we don't really have time to get into the weeds of the methodology behind Arceo's calculations on this or Tini's calculations can on energy. I tell you one thing okay. on this one? I mean, you can give me the names and the telephone number of the engineers that did the calculation because I'm going to hire them immediately. <laughs> okay? Immediately. Are you happy to connect yeah, with engineers? Yeah, yeah. Immediately. <laughs> so this is uh, because, you know, when, when we say a thousand euro cost, two thousand euro price, it's not that we, you know, you know we wake up in the morning, we, we throw a thing. We have done our math and we are the guys that do the job. So if there's someone that can do it for a third of the price, you know, very good, excellent. What, what is happening, and I'm answering to what uh, Benjamin is saying, is what we experience right now, especially with tier one suppliers, is that all the tier one suppliers, and then you have two, three, and four, they're actually completely moving out of investing on combustion engine, all of them. So you will see the wave coming on the thing because there are few of them, few, ten the big ones. They're all going out. This, I think is, this is a really good point. Also, something you, you mentioned earlier as well. You could, we could continue this forever, but I want to end uh, with, with you guys talking about 2035. Alexander, um, d Luca just mentioned that this was a broad target. I mean, it is. We know that there's a zero emissions mandate that's w waiting to be turned into law, but actually right now it doesn't look like that's going to happen anytime soon. So what's your stance? What's the check position on 2035? Should it, um, should it be stored forever? Will it be stored forever if there is an e-fuels fix? No, look, we are supporting Germany uh, in their effort to, uh, to, to, to follow the, the path of the uh, technological neutrality. So let's uh, give the combustion engine, if they are for the e fuels, uh, give them the chance. Because, in fact, uh, this is where the Germans, Czech engineers, are still able to sk this accurate skill work. Chinese combustion cars are very bad. Even I was visiting Kadarash last year, where they are pro constructing this uh, tokamak. And you know, the Asians, it's an international venture. The engines are fast, but they have to repair, while the Germans are accurate. So we are in th just giving up our competitive advantage in favor of something where we are lacking behind from the first moment. So I'm in favor of uh, keeping the combustion engines uh, alive. Uh, we'll see you know, whether you know, we would be able, for example, with nuclear, as, as has been said, uh, to produce the fuels in future uh, much cheaper than now. That will show us the future. So, but let's keep the freedom of choice to the businesses instead of uh, introducing the command economy, which I remember and which is ineffective and which led us into the catastrophe. And I don't want to uh, be in the catastrophe again. Yeah, I, I'll just wish to mention, but, but many would also say that the toxic emissions from older gas guzzling vehicles are also catastrophic. Yeah, look, uh, she, she, she mentioned uh, a, 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 a raw materials, uh, the, the rare raw materials storages in, the, 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 in Europe, you know. Yes, lithium, my country has second and the third, or third largest uh, deposits of lithium. It's in northwestern Bohemia, where I live. 
this region has been terribly damaged by coal mining and now with decarbonization they are happy you know because finally they feel the relief <coughs> at the horizon and the lithiums it's just in the adjacent mountain when they are going to make their sports where are the national parks or uh, natura 2000 reservation mm. so i will invite you to convince these people to agree in the process of AR to agree with the mining of lithium, you know, uh, to save the world. So they conversation for, for another be happy time. happy or not. Is that we need to close this up before I get shouted at by our managers here for occupying this beautiful space for, for way too long. Ben against the mining, but, you know, the politics is not easy. But Benjamin, on 2035, how do we fix this? I presume your views are not too dissimilar to Alexander's. So, uh, the automotive suppliers have for years argued that there should be choice, uh, there should be technology openness, that there should be a strong role for electromobility, that there should be, as a complement, other technologies allowed. Solutions are there. It's a bit difficult to, uh, to implement them because political positions are quite entrenched. But if there is one that makes a difference in the real world, happy to look at it. If th it does, happy to support it. And Julia, 2035. Um, so maybe I will say that I want to really stress that actually as st &E, we really don't think that the transition will be easy, right? And we don't for a second think that all these solutions are easy off the shelf, do them tomorrow. But 2035 going zero is what we need to have any chance to meet our climate neutrality goals. And that's just for the climate, for us to, to, to survive. But to be there and for this energy transition, which is difficult, and all the challenges today that were mentioned by Mr. Vondra, by Mr. Demer, they're all true. We are really actively working on them as well. And we need to be honest, honest about the trade-offs. Yes, we will have to be more comfortable with mining. And I am from an NGO and I say that. We will have to have those conversations. We will have to have honest conversations about jobs. But what is the the, the other side of it. It's not just about letting our planet burn or cities choking in pollution. It is the competitiveness of our industry. Whether we like it or not, the future industry is electric. And as a really proud European, I want European companies to be at the forefront of it. And this is the only way to go is now to you know, roll up the sleeves, come together, stop talking up problems, and talk up solutions and work together to make it done. So I hope we agree on 2035 because we're really wasting precious time doing. Yeah, and let's just say the guy actually that's negotiating this with the Germans for the European Commission was supposed to be here, but sadly, late yesterday he cancelled because his agenda didn't have enough time. Uh, this is obviously a big shame for us because it's quite a secretive deal that they're working out, and it would have been nice to hear that explanation from him, but hopefully he's, uh, he's available next time for a chat with us. Um, that's, we've got to close it there. We've run out of time. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming on site today in our beautiful office. Thank you to uh, Sarah for making this possible. Um, it should give you the results of the Slido poll that we carried out would rising car prices put you off investing in a new car uh, that was i say his question for everybody in the room actually quite a few of you did respond um the answers were yes i would hold on to my current car a bit longer yes i'd buy a second hand car instead or no i would buy a new car regardless and it's the first answer yes i would hold on to my current car a bit longer that clearly won with 58 percent of the of the vote so that's not um Why is it more expensive? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, questions for the, the next edition. <laughs> uh, so thanks again, everybody. Thanks to our events team for making this possible. And I think that's all the, the stuff I have to say today. And the, the video will be there for everyone to view in the morning. All right. Good afternoon, guys. Thank you. This is an, an age of disruption, of profound revolutionary change. What we're really asking ministers is to empower the ambassadors. The only thing that you really push forth is the truth. You don't see many women represented when it comes to the decisions as to how to handle the pandemic.